So, welcome everybody to the Hamsta Colloquium, our distinguished speaker series, where we invite people uh, working with an intelligent and embedded systems uh, that we find, whose work we find inspiring. And today, we have been invited Professor Christopher Nugent from University of Ulster in Northern Ireland. Uh, Chris Nugent, if I may call you. Yes, Chris, that's fine. Uh, works in ambient assisted living and heads a group there uh, of uh, more than 40 people who have been active in this. And um, it's called the Smart Environments Research Group. And uh, you've been the grant holder of several EU projects and other projects in this area. Uh, you're the associate editor for many of the journals in this field. And you have actually contributed to course development in this uh, area as well at the University of Ulster. Uh, computer with healthcare degree and the postgraduate certificate in health informatics at the University of Ulster, which you will tell us about later, uh, but not perhaps during this talk. Uh, we will welcome uh, to you, Chris, here. We will, you will talk about self-management self of health and well-being, the role of smart environments, and uh, what role the, intel or the technology can play in our future healthcare. Okay. Welcome. Thanks very much. Um, okay, hello everybody. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity um, to come along um, today and, and to speak with you. I guess I should thank Roland and Jens uh, really for this, uh, so thanks very much. Um, I think I'm the only person in Sweden today who has a tie on, so I feel <laughs> quite quite strange about this, but uh, let's, see, let's see what happens. So yeah, I'm, I'm from the University of, uh, of Ulster in Northern Ireland. Um, and this is a, a sort of a title that I put together that I thought would be interesting to talk to you, talk to you about some of the research that we are involved um, in our group. So I, I've tried to make it quite quite general and quite technical at the same time. So it's um, I, hopefully there'll be a little bit of something for um, everybody in, in the talk today. So just to give you very quickly a, um, a background of, of where I'm from in the university, we have around 1,500 faculty staff in the university. 24,000 students. Um, we have six faculties and I'm from the computing and engineering faculty and specifically within that in the School of, of Computing and Maths. And we have four campus in Northern Ireland um, which are that's, uh, well about 100 kilometres between the, the, the two furthest ones apart. Um, so it, it, it works quite well um, in, in, in terms of putting the um, campuses in different locations for for our students, and there's there's where we are on the map. So you can see we're we're quite quite close. Um, I did Google last night. I must have made a mistake because it took me 11 hours to travel, and I took two flights on one train. And I googled last night, and I think it said if I drove, it would take me nine hours if I went through Europe. But I'm sure I'm sure I made some some mistake, and I was quite sleepy. But yeah, maybe I'll try that the next time. So yeah, that, that that's where I'm from, and that's the entrance to our university. So you're very welcome to. Um, to come and um, visit us at any time. Um, I'll talk more about this later on in, uh, in, in the presentation when I give you more of an overview of, of what we actually do um, in our group, but <coughs> um, I come from uh, specifically a research group um, which focuses on smart environments and we're interested to look at the use of technology to promote the amount of time an elderly person or someone with a long-term chronic condition can stay in their home environment. And that's a very broad mission, but uh, that's been our mission now since we set up the group in 2000 and, uh, 2009. Um, and we now have 48 members in the group, so we're really expanding quite quickly. Um, with 25 PhD students, we have uh, 10 um, faculty, staff and the rest are funded, are, are postdocs funded from external projects. And there's some pictures of our labs, I'll come back and talk to you in a little bit more detail um, about that later on in, in the presentation. So just to, to waken everybody up with, with uh, quite a bright slide here after, after lunch, um, what's been the motivation or what's really been the rationale for our work in, in this area? Well, there's lots and lots of statistics and probably I could just speak the whole time today about statistics, but um, I think this is, this is very, very important um, to appreciate that by 20, 2050, there's going to be 2 billion people um, in the world who are going to be age 60 and over. So we all know about the uh, demographic um, change that we're witnessing and the impact that that has. At the minute we have around a million, a million people, a million elderly people who require some form of care. That's going to treble to nearly 280 million 
um, by 2050. So with this increase in population is coming an increase in the prevalence of health conditions and increase in the challenges that we have to try and support um, people um, in their own home and with management of, uh, of sort of um, health conditions. So this is the real motivation and this has been the real driver from the work of my group and I guess um, it's a lot of the work I've seen already today as a knock-on effect and, and we're all trying to um, see if, or, or, or solve the same problem. So what I want to do is, is to talk about this sort of area, the impact that it's having. I want to tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing um, within our group. And I want to talk about four specific areas um, that we're focusing on to try and improve or to try and have some marginal gain um, in, in terms of performance and then um, just have some concluding remarks and maybe a, a discussion at the end based on um, what, what I've gone through here. So just to, to set the context or to, um, to summarise what I've said, um, population is growing and growing and that's at, a, that's at a global level. That means we have more elderly people. They want um, really to stay in their own home environment even if they know that they're at some form of risk. And that's, that's quite a frightening statistic on one side, but on the other hand, it's something that we really need to listen to and we really need to think about the quality of life or the impact of not being able to support someone within their home environment. So this is really, if we talk about a, solving a, a, a user-centric problem, this is the issue, this is what our focus has been upon, to try and put in place a service that we can keep someone at home for, for as long as possible. Um, the second point, which is uh, a very important as well, that you'll all appreciate, there are fewer younger people to care for the elderly. So there's a lot of healthcare comes from our healthcare systems in each, uh, each region or each country, but we do rely on a lot of informal care. And as the population grows, there becomes less and less people to provide that informal care or social care or social contact, which has a huge importance on our, on our lives as well. Um, and as I said and I showed on the, the, the second slide, the, the, there's a, a huge increase in the prevalence of health conditions now with this change in the population structure. Um, so what we want to do or what we want to think about is, um, I should have said to start, I'm an electronic engineer, I trained as an electronic engineer. Um, and what I'm interested or how I'm addressing this problem is to see are there some new ways or some new solutions from a technology perspective that we can introduce that will try and address or try and solve these challenges that I think collectively we're all interested or we're all trying to, um, to look at from some perspective. So ICT and healthcare, that's the opportunity, that's the focus or that's the theme. But why don't we see more of it or what are the challenges or what are the barriers really to, to the uptake of the use of this technology? And studies have shown that fewer than 30% of people are using technology to address healthcare challenges. And that goes from a patient perspective, from a healthcare um, professional's perspective, maybe from a, from a surgeon's perspective, all different um, sort, of, sort of views on life. So what are those what are those challenges or what are those reasons or, or why is this the case? And if you think about well, what names does technology and healthcare go under and what have been the challenges or why is there this uh, lack of uptake or lack of, of use of, of the technology? I tried to put together some terminology that we might be familiar with here or, or you've heard about in the past. So we all talk about telehealth, telemedicine and telecare and to a certain extent these have gained some bad press or they've gained some bad publicity from introduction 20 or 30 years ago of trying to solve solutions and um, maybe not offering what um, we set out to do or what we, in we intended to do. And then we moved into the, the area of the, or, or the era of health. So we have e-health, m-health, p-health and c-health. Um, then we have personal health systems and ICT and healthcare. Um, and we also have ambient assisted living, assisted living and assistive technology. Um, the list goes on. Um, Health 2.0, which is probably the most contemporary um, term that I, I think I've heard. It's very interesting leverage in the use of Web 2.0 technologies in healthcare. And one that, that uh, we're quite familiar with in the UK and I think in Europe as well is this, this terminology of connected health. So that leaves us somewhere in the middle. Well, which one is it or what has been the problems or what is the differences? And I think even from a technical point of view, this is a challenge for us to start off, to fight our way through and see which one we actually focus on or which one we should, we should move on. So we have all of these opportunities, all of these efforts uh, here from a research perspective, and yet the figures show that we only have 30% uptake um, of them in, in real, real term deployment. So obviously there's some challenge or there's some issue that, uh, that, that we have to deal with or we have to take into account. 
So I thought a little bit about uh, the timeline of research in this area over the, over the past 10 years. And if you look back as well and look at the funding programs in the EU FP5, FP6, FP7, which sort of cuts across these, these 10 years, and think about the effort that you made and what you'd actually focused on. Um, I found something quite interesting looking back at the calls or the specific targets for funding over those, uh, that period of time. So we had common research themes over this period. So maybe 10 years ago we talked about decision support systems and we talked about monitoring devices so tangible pieces of, of hardware and then we moved into assistive technologies and context of work computing and now we've moved into an era of okay we need to have long-term evaluations we need to offer patient empowerment we need to deal with all of the challenges so we have scalability so we have rollout so we have um, interoperability all of the barriers that we are all witnessing and talking about for the lack of the uptake of, of these solutions. And what that has done to our, to our effort over time is the amount of time we spend from a technology or a device development perspective has definitely decreased. And the amount of time that we spend engaging with users, engaging with evaluations, engaging with user-centered design, iterative prototype development has really increased. And all of, the, all of the, the, the calls, all of the focuses now that we look at from Europe and above or at a regional level, all consider large-scale evaluation, public patient involvement, user evaluation, iterative prototype um, development, users as designers of solutions, and it's really changed the landscape of, um, of how we work or how we operate. So from a certain point of view as a, as a technologist, um, we have changed or we've had to change our skills a little bit. And this morning I think anybody who um, was part of the meetings or maybe you know uh, who, who I met with this morning, we talked a lot about user evaluations, we talked a lot about the design and less so about the technology. And I think those discussions map on very much with this view that I had or that I've looked back over um, how our role as engineers or how our role as technologists um, have changed changed over the years. So this is, this is really where we are now and some of the initial documentation for Horizon 2020 has said we, we have to have 5,000 um, users for evaluations. That was some of the preliminary material. I don't know if the numbers are, are going to reach that scale, um, but we're currently involved in proposal that aims to attract 3,000 um, participants over a four-year period. So it's having a huge impact um, on our work and what we can actually deliver and what we can um, actually produce. So the, the, the title of the, 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 present today, the presentation today had this, this notion of self-management embedded in the title. Um, and self-management um, is coupled very, very closely with the term of, of patient empowerment. Um, and we talked about self-management and I've been involved in self-management projects um, using ICT solutions for quite some time. But I think it's important that we just stop and look and think, well, what really is the self-management paradigm? And how does it map on to what we're trying to do to address this, this demographic challenge? And there's three points here that I, I think are, are very, very important um, that we need to consider or we need to think about. So the first one, um, the, the concept of self-management is that the patient themselves learn more about their condition. And the ethos there is if someone can learn about their condition, they can make more informed decisions themselves, rather than relying on somebody else um, to support um, and to maintain or, or to improve their health condition. So it's one about um, patient education, about what are the issues associated with the condition, and two about making an informed decision that is either going to maintain or to improve the health status. And the third point then is about behaviour change. If we can understand what the challenges are, if we can understand what we do to change our lifestyle or to change our environment and how that has a positive effect, then that's going to have a behaviour change and we'll adopt or we'll change, we'll, we'll sort of modify things over time. So as a, as, a, as a patient, and if we want to have real patient empowerment, we can set our own life goals or we can set our own targets, which we'll be personally motivated to do. So rather than rely on someone else to set our targets, if we can say, um, or we can specify what they are, um, from your own perspective through an ICT solution, then the motivation there is likely to be higher that you'll um, adhere or you'll comply with, with the system. So the main uh, challenge then that we have from a technology point of view is how can we understand what the condition is, measure, process, and this part is really important, provide some feedback 
so that we can have this interaction to understand what it is we're doing, what, what impact or what positive or negative change that is having on our health condition, what targets do we want to set, and then the behaviour change will be instilled after that. So what are the role of, uh, what's the role of smart environments or what's the opportunity for us from, from a technology point of view? And if you think of a, of a smart environment, um, I've drawn a house here, we can think of this as a hospital or a classroom or a community centre or whatever the environment may be. We can really think of it as having three main components at, at a high level. We can take information from our sensors from the environment, so we might have um, some motion sensing or we might have video or we might have contact. Um, sensors, any type of information that we can glean from the environment. And then we have to have a, uh, an information processing module um, from a computer science perspective. And then we need to have some way that we can control or we can um, inform or change the environment. So we think of a very, very simple situation. We can measure the temperature, we can detect that the temperature is too warm, and we can control the temperature through a thermostat. So that's a very, very simple um, scenario to portray what a smart environment offers. But I think you can agree that we can, we can split it up into these three main components. And this is the area that uh, we are challenged with. This is the area that the complexity happens, how we deal with the different ways that people have different behaviours, how everybody is different, um, how your, your behaviour changes over time. And this is probably where the, I would say 90-95% of the work in our group is focused um, on how do we develop solutions, how do we process the information at this level. And it's really in here that I want to talk about or focus on more for the, for the rest of um, the presentation today. So if we think about um, what we want to do with the information, how do we manage that or, or, or how do we model it, um, what we can do is we can put a lot of sensor technology into the environment, we can monitor what somebody does in the environment and then we can try and model what that typical behaviour will be like. So we can take behaviour, we can split it up at a very, very simple level into a number of linear tasks. And I'll come back to that notion of, of a linear task later on because it is a slightly um, simplistic representation of, of how we want to um, control or how we want to assess the, the behaviour in the environment. So if we think about the, the, um, the process of maybe preparing a, a cup of tea, we have steps like we want to boil the water, we want to put um, water in with a tea bag, we, we want to, we want to flavour or we want to um, add some milk or some sugar or some lemon in, in, into the cup. So what we, what we need to do from a computer science perspective is to create these models, to create them with all different possibilities that we might have, um, break up into the linear stages and try and have a representation that covers every eventuality that a person could go through undertaking any of these activities. So that's a, a very incomplete model, I'm sure you'll, you'll agree, but even at that level you can see the complexity um, of just a simple, simple task of um, wanting to monitor how someone prepares a drink um, in the kitchen environment. And if you think about scaling that up to deal with all um, different people's uh, sort of process or steps through this simple activity, you start to understand that it becomes a very complex situation. So what we want to do from this model, I would say, is, is two things. One, we want to look and see um, remotely through, tech, through the use of technology, is someone undertaking this task? Let, let's say, for example, is someone preparing a cup of tea? And we want to monitor the change in that behaviour over time because that can reflect or that can give us some, some information of a change in health status. So we might want to look and see how many mistakes the person makes or are they taking longer to do that than they have done over the past two or three months. And the second thing that we can use technology for is if we can understand or if we can appreciate that someone is stuck in the middle of a task, then we can offer some prompt or some support to give them guidance or some indication of what, what the next um, step should actually be. So they, they uh, should have said in, in this example we have uh, um, uh, some sensors in uh, in the environment in this this diagram. Uh, th this was a, an RFID 
um, glove, one of the one of the classical um, sort of solutions that would first come out of um, the Intel labs whenever they created the first behavioural models um, um, based on uh, activity assessment. So the types of video we can have, we could have video data, sensor data, activity data to measure physical exercise, we can have physiological data, um, and we can look at this at, at two different levels of, of granularity. We can think at a very coarse level that we can track a person in the environment, we can look at what interaction a person has, we can look at what an activity level is, is it on or off, and we can just measure vital signs. And if we look at a more finer grained level, we can see well, what not only is what someone doing in terms of tracking, but what is their motion, what is their actual path of activities. Um, if we look and drill down at a, at a more specific level, we can look at the timing and the sequencing of object interactions. Um, we can look from activity um, data, what was the activity the person was engaged in. And from a physiological point of view, we can look at trend analysis, for example, blood pressure change, heart rate change over time. So lots of information that we can gather, we can start to process it at different levels. And what can we do with that? For example, we can look at confusion levels from um, a motion tracking point of view. We can start to consider ADL assessment, look at cognitive decline. We can look at change in vital signs. What does it mean the blood pressure has increased or decreased correlated with some heart rate activity? So we can take all of this information from off-the-shelf devices that we can start to build a, a bigger or more complete um, behavioural picture. And what we need to do then with that is to offer some form of intervention. This is the most important part that we close the loop. So we can either involve a healthcare professional, we can offer some activity assistance or some automatic prompting, or what we're interested in is, is offering the opportunity to self-manage, to provide some feedback, to provide some opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of the health condition to allow behaviour change or to allow some way to manage the own condition, set some targets and try and achieve those targets and hopefully have a a positive um, outcome from the process. So that's the, uh, the sort of rationale of, of why we want to look in, in this area. Uh, the last sort of few slides looked at more generic or, or, or more sort of abstract view um, of what we can do from the technology. I want to just give you a little bit of an insight o over um, our group at, at the University of Ulster and, and some of the resources that, um, that we have. So this is a this is a floor plan of um, the department that I'm based in. Um, so we have about 20 faculty offices are along one side of the corridor, and these are all of our um, research labs. And we have just under um, 7,000 square foot of a four floor plan of this environment. So all of these environments are sensorized. So we have sensors on the doors. And um, these are I'll show you pictures in a second. These are our labs within a lab. So if you open a cupboard, if you sit down, if you move in and out of a room, you can measure your weight. We have temperature sensors. Um, at any time, we could have 400 nodes collecting information in, in this environment. So we, we, we think we have a very nice set of, a, um, of equipment, a very nice set of sensor technologies. We now have put in place the software architecture to manage the integration of all of the data. And we have a data model, and everybody is moving towards this one common platform to work towards um, for either the storage of the data, retrieval of the data, or the use of, of software interfaces to present the data. So this is, uh, uh, here we have four labs. This is our kitchen, living room, meeting room, and our robotics lab. I just want to show you some, uh, some pictures here. So this is our... Um, our living room that we created in, in, in 2009. Um, and I, I was sort of discussing with some people um, over lunch. We, we created this really to support our experimentations within the group. And now we, we do use it for experimentations, but we use it more for demonstrations of the research and some of the, some of the projects that we're involved in. And it's a very nice environment, it's a very good environment that we, we can bring maybe potential collaborators in, people from the health service, people for companies to have some idea of, of the work that we're engaged in. So here we have a sensorized floor and we put pressure sensors under the floor and we have a connex backbone um, for integration of, of, uh, of uh, sensors and actuators within the environment. And we have a range of different, um, mainly our assistive technology projects are, are, are based in the living room. So this is our, our 
smart kitchen. Um, it's not a functional kitchen, so we don't have uh, running water or we don't have it sort of plumb, but everything that you'd want to do in terms of making a drink, making a meal, if you want to take something out of the fridge, um, all of the cupboards, all of the objects are, are highly sensorized. So if we want to um, conduct some experiments and gather some data, it's a very nice environment for us to sensorize everything in the environment and we can record sensor interactions and video interactions as well. Um, this is our, uh, it's now our, our body scanning lab. So we have a 3D body scanner um, that we can take a full 3D um, um, profile. And we use this uh, with some of our work in, in creating intelligent um, garments that we want to have a very close fit to the size and shape and we can customize clothing which has an impact on, on the, the way we place the sensors on the body. This is a 3D environment scanner um, and that's a Toby eye tracker we use for um, some of our uh, um, UI uh, evaluation studies. So very nice in environments that uh, support the experimentation and the, the demonstration um, of our work. Um, I put this slide in, I could probably come back and talk about each of these projects um, on their own, but we, we've been involved in quite a lot of EU projects since uh, this was our first introduction of Medicaid in, in FP5 um, over, the, over the past, um, I would say, 10 years. This was a project that looked at medication management. This was a project that looked at assistive technologies for people with dementia. This was a project that looked at uh, brain-computer interfaces for quadriplegics. Nocturnal was a project for um, guiding people with dementia at nighttime if they wandered. Demacare is a, is a project running at the minute trying to offer support for carers of people with dementia. And Michelangelo was home-based assessment of autistic children. So we, we've had quite a, a, a good story in the Ian inclusion area through FP5, FP6 and FP7. And we have a number of other areas that are funded uh, at a local and a regional level. Um, this is a project which has is, is lasted from 2006 and we've received further funding through to 2015 to look at the delivery of video based reminders on mobile phones for people with dementia. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about technology adoption models which is part of the study as the fourth part of the, the presentation. We've looked at uh, multimedia training tools for the cares of people with dementia. Um, we have a lot of effort has gone into the self-management of COPD, CHF, stroke uh, and chronic pain. Um, and we have a number of projects that have looked at uh, larger scale evaluations of assistive technologies again and um, focusing on, on people with dementia. So this, this has kept us very busy over the past years but it's part of the, I think, the, su the success and the sustainability um, of our research group. Um, in terms of the, the research output um, from our group, we, we do, even though we're 95% computer scientists and, and engineers, we have published across quite, a, uh, quite a, a broad range of forums from theoretical computer science like um, uh, KDE and um, SMC. Um, the majority of our work would be, would be focused in an applied area. I should really update that as, as Journal of uh, Biomedical Health Informatics now. And we have published in purely clinical for, uh, forums like aging and mental health and aging. And that's quite interesting from a, a group of, of technical people that we cover both the theoretical applied and the purely clinical side of, of the research as well. Um, and we've, we have a lot of good relationships, which I think is, is very important with different clinical um, domains or different clinical partners. Dementia, uh, I would say, covers 60% of the application domain of our work. We've worked with chronic pre and strokes, CHF and COPD, autism for children, um, cardiology, EG analysis for BCI. Um, and a little bit of work on Parkinson's disease. So we have cut across quite a, a range of clinical areas as well um, with the technology that we work with. So what, what I want to talk to you about uh, um, now is, and this was really the challenge to try and get the material to cover a general audience, was to think about, well, uh, what's interesting to tell you today specifically about some of the work that we're involved in. Uh, evolved in. And I thought it was, it was interesting to focus on um, 
and it, was, uh, it took me a bit of time to realise that this is what we were actually doing in our research group, but we have tried to incrementally increase the performance of how we can measure activity, how we can measure what is the, um, the physical process a person is doing, how accurate can we measure heart rate. And everybody, or a lot of research centres are involved in this level or these types of activities, but we're incrementally increasing the performance. And what I thought was, well, we're really maximising the marginal gain. And whenever I looked at what, what activities we're doing in, in the group, there's four real areas that we're trying to focus on. And I want to just touch on each of those um, to give you a little bit more insight in, into what, what we have done. So one area is managing incomplete sensor data. So we can talk about, let's build a behavioural model for someone who's going to we want to monitor making um, preparing a cup of tea. And we want to look at all ADLs and we talk about, let's put 300 sensors into a home. And what we find two days later is 20 of them have broken, two have fallen off, three have been lifted by somebody else. So what, what happens? How do we actually manage that from a computational point of view? The second point is, um, how do we mix something like video data with sensor data with uh, vital sign data and what does it mean and what extra additional context do we get from that and that's important and that's an, an interesting opportunity for us to consider. Um, the third area um, which I think is the most practical is tech technology adoption models. So what I've talked about here, and we can think about remote monitoring or wearable technologies or reminding technologies, they're only going to work for specific uh, parts of the population. And what we're trying to do is identify from the outset what is the profile of a person who would use a reminding technology or who would use um, an activity monitor. And if we can identify them from the start, then we're going to have higher levels of compliance. Um, and the final area um, is considering um, how, can we, how can we increase the accuracy of something like a step count or the accuracy of a physical monitor by considering in detail the combination, the positioning of accelerometry technology on, on the body. So I just want to dip in a little bit into these four areas and then maybe afterwards or later this afternoon I can um, talk in more detail at a technical level um, from the perspective uh, of each of these views. So the first one, practical challenges within, uh, within smart environments. So this, this is the data that we typically have to deal with. And that's about 20 minutes of data um, that we recorded from one of our, our smart home projects. And if we look uh, at detail, we can see here, well, um, that's probably the, the, the time and the date. That's the identification of what the sensor is. That's maybe the measurements. That's probably a temperature sensor. And we can pull out all of this information and we can start to think, well, this is, this is what we have to deal with. And we, from a computer science point of view, we have to make some sense of that. So what does this actually mean? Open the door, use phone, open the fridge. We have no idea what happened here. Lift the kettle, use sink, turn on light. So I, I talked about this break, uh, the ADL of making tee up into these linear activities, but whenever we look at this data, we have to identify, well, where's the start and the end? And we have to deal with how we got interleaved activities. So we can start to split these two types of um, sensor recordings into two parallel streams. So what we actually had here was we had two people in the environment interacting with two different tasks at the same time. So we can... Uh, this is really the interesting or the challenging point. So what happens if the sensor breaks? What happens if, it, if someone takes it, which has happened? What happens if it interferes or transmits and loses the data? And these are all of the practical challenges that we've seen over the past four or five years whenever we roll our solutions out or um, we, we, we try and engage in real environments to evaluate and test the impact of these solutions. So um, this is just a list of what I think can go wrong or what has gone wrong with some of the technology or some of the sensor technologies that we've used. So it can be faulty. I think we would all agree with, with that. Um, it, could be, it could malfunction. It might read 100% accuracy. Something might have a tolerance like a temperature sensor. Um, if we have a, just a simple problem like the battery runs out or sometimes when the battery is low we don't have um, optimal performance, we could have a transmission error or we could have just a, a pure IT error from a, a data processing point of view. So what we have developed or what we looked at in our work was can we develop a model, can we develop an approach which deals with this uncertainty in the data. So that's a, a, a classical um, 
information engineering problem of what can we do or what uh, what impact is this going to have and how resilient can their approaches be if some of this information goes missing or becomes corrupt, which it does and which we find does actually happen. So we based our work on um, some evidence theory using um, uh, are really off the back of the work of, of Dempster Schaefer. And we, we developed these things that we, we, we called um, evidential networks. So we looked at all of the ADLs, we looked at preparing a drink, um, maybe grooming, um, some housework using the telephone, and we studied those and we tried to create what sensors, or try to understand what sensors would be involved, what was the relationship, how could we combine all of that information. And we developed this set of um, uh, evidential networks or evidential ontologies where we mapped the sensor information on the objects, we mapped the objects in the combination of the evidence, and we tried to deal with what would happen if the sensor became corrupt or if we lost information here, and what impact would that have to the overall classification. So we built and we developed this uh, um, seven stage process of how we could manage um, the information um, and if you're interested this uh um, this publication that we made in 2009 provides all, all of the details and, and it's actually turned out to be our, our most cited paper from our, our research group to date. Um, so just to, to run through it very quickly, if, if we look over here, what we can do is we can, we can take our, our sensor value and we can discount how accurate or otherwise that information may be and that's one of the core principles of um, Dempster Schaefer. We can then um, translate what the sensor is to the object so if we say this is a sensor attached to the cup then we can map that onto um, the object of whether it's a cup whether it's a kettle whether it's um, the fridge we can then infer if the fridge is open that someone has taken some milk out of it because that's part of, of this ADL and um, we have a if, if we have a decision to make we can maximize between um, the amount of information that's propagated through our network we can then um, translate our masses to um, a composite and we're moving towards the final decision process we can weight this in terms of what other activities are going on within the environment if we have um, um, parallel streams of information. We can then translate this composite um, into an activity. At the very end we have this decision which says this person in the environment based on all this information is, is making a drink. So the main part here is not only do we have a classification model but we have some resilience to deal with the uncertainty of the data that might happen in these practical situations. So what we did was um, uh, this is this is a typical sort of video recording that we would have from someone in our environment and we put a camera and we put a number of, of sensors into our kitchen and we recorded people making tea and coffee over a, uh, over a period of, of four or five weeks so that's just an excerpt from the database and that's the um, a set of, of seven sensors that we rec that we use to record between these three different activities so we recorded this information we developed our model we optimized the model and we were able to identify what activity between these three tasks a person was undertaking and then what we did was we, t we removed some information to indicate the scenario when information was missing so if we made all of our sensor recording zero for a specific type of sensor that would give us an indication like some of the um, scenarios I showed a few slides ago that it might be broken somebody's taken it it might fall off all of the practical situations that we're we're trying to deal with so I'll look I'll just show these these three graphs there's quite a lot going on in these graphs but what we really want to look at is uh, the belief value here of, of these sort of pink traces on the graphs and what we have along our x-axis are different combinations of sensors. So we had seven sensors to, to monitor the information in the environment and what we did here was we um, took out one specific sensor and looked at different permutations. Here we took out two sensors and here we took out three sensors. And we put in a confidence threshold of, of just under 70% to indicate are we sure that this activity is happening or not. So with our model you can see here that even with uh, all of the different permutations with one sensor failing, we still were able to accommodate with a, a, a reliable level what the activity was. Whenever we took um, two sensors only with a few permutations, we crossed our reliability threshold. And here, um, if we think about the scenario where we, we took three sensors, 
sensors out of the environment, which is three out of seven pieces of information. It's quite significant from an information engineering perspective. We could see that this became uh, a random decision-making process. So what, what did that actually mean or what, what can we infer from this? Well, really there's three things. What we can do is, uh, with our approach, we can assess the impact that'll happen if we have sensor failure. The second thing that we can do is we can identify which of these permutations of sensors have the biggest impact um, if they were to fail. And the third thing that we can do is we can maybe pinpoint what are the most important pieces of technology that someone who's providing the service in this environment should look at if they're providing some support or some monitoring. So this was a, a, a computational approach that we developed and we've, we've ruled out now, this was only focused on the process or the ADL of, of preparing one um, cup of tea. We've now ruled this model out and the number um, of uh, um, a number of different types of ADLs and we've shown the same resilience um, that, we, that we saw here under the instances of sensor failure. Okay, uh, the second thing then um, is to look at the combination of, of different data sources. So um, if we think of just a sensor that, I, that we put on a, on a cup or on a fridge door, on a, a door in, in and out of a room, we can see that it's open or we can see that it's closed, but we don't know who has gone into the room. We don't know as the person at a basic level entered the room or left the room, we don't know if two or three people have, have gone into the environment. So typically we have our information um, which is gleaned from our, our, our sensor bank in the environment and then we have an information management um, process where we can, uh, like the previous sort of set of slides where we can try and classify what has happened. So if we take this classical model, then there's a lot of challenges, multiple occupancy, interleaved activities that, that we can't deal with. So what we want to think about is um, if we have um, multiple information sources, then we have a much richer picture of the environment. So if we take a video feed, if we take a sensor feed, if we take vital sign feed, we have a much richer um, understanding of, of what's going on in the environment. So I'll show you uh, just a, a, another video here. Um, so this is someone going into our, um, in our kitchen, and as they interact with different, um, open the cupboards or close the cupboards, this is the information that's recorded in their database. So we have another person who's gonna come along here. And they open the same cupboard, but we just record it as a, a different event, and then they're going to, I think this time, open the fridge. So this is the information that's recorded um, just in our database. So we're on to our fourth event. And then the first person is going to come back into the scene again and open two more cupboards. Oh, sorry, both of them come in. Okay. So now we have two cupboards I've opened here. And one more time, I think they come back in. I thought they'd run away there and they're going to come back. Okay. So this is the information that is recorded in our, in our database. So what I want to show here is, um, can you even remember who did this activity for the two people? Um, I, I can't, and I've seen this video maybe 20 or 30 times, I can't remember. So with just, if we're just taking the raw sensor data and we have two people in the environment or if we have two people in the home, over time it becomes very difficult to trace this uh, type of information. So let's look at if we just augment this with video feed as well. So here we have an additional tag that we can add into the data that we know there's one specific person just by the color of their clothing in the environment and we still have the original data that we can push in their database and we'll have our second person now so we know from the profile it's a different person and we can start to input different data or different information and we augment that on top of our sensor uh, data so this is the the same scenario we just added a video processing feed over the top of it there's something laggy with the the video here i'm not Sure. Um, so yeah, I think you can start to appreciate the idea if you have two different pieces of information, one looking at video, one looking at sensor, we have a much richer understanding of what has happened in the environment and we can start to, if you think back to the previous example, we can appreciate which person is in the environment and, and interacted with um, which object. 
So we, we, we took this, I've used that as a, as a basic idea to show um, the idea of augmenting just basic sensor inf uh, information within the environment. But what we want to do is really build a model that we have a person, we want to understand what their behavior is, but we need to have more than one stream of, of data. So we've looked at a scenario, or what we want to consider is a scenario, we have our sensor data, and we also have our vital sign data. The previous example showed um, video, but what was interesting, or what we've looked at is, can we correlate, or can we look at the difference between, um, or correlation between vital sign data and basic sensor data that we would gather in the environment, and build a hybrid analysis or hybrid model from that. So we, we, we made a number of experiments and we used a, quite, a, quite a rudimentary technique of, of QSUM to look at the, the shifts of, of the mean in the process. We recorded heart rate and we recorded accelerometry signals over time. So the QSUM really looks at a, a, a cumulative sum of the differences between um, the information of the data that we record in the process mean within a specific um, time frame. So we can cal calculate the QSUM and then we look at the point of minimum variance to see where a change happened in that recorded in, in a window of time. So this is heart rate and we can identify here that there was a significant change in the heart rate. So something has obviously happened. In this case the heart rate is, has um, significantly decreased and we can say okay or we can look for that change point and flag that as, as a specific condition. So what we wanted to do or what we want to consider is can we take a or can we make a correlation between someone's heart rate and the activity that they're undertaking and identify those within a correlation of the two signals of the two different streams of information that were recorded. So this is the uh, information taken from the heart rate. This was the start of an activity as someone walked upstairs. This was the detected as the change point based on the, outpu uh, the output of the, um, the QSUM algorithm. So this is our, just our, our accelerometry um, data. This was the, the start of the activity and if we look here that was the correlation just in time with these two signals uh, sorry, synchronized um, with the change point. So what we were able to show was that indeed there was a correlation between when we saw a change point in the heart rate and when we saw the change actually happening from the activity point of view. So someone was stationary here and then they be began their activity. Now there is a delay of, um, I think it was on average eight seconds between the start of the activity and the detection of the change point. But the purpose really of this analysis was we were able to correlate these two quite different signals. So what we wanted to work towards or what we're working towards now is can we um, correlate the, uh, based on the change and the time between the start of an activity and the change point what those two different activities are. So this just shows a summary of, uh, well we only had, uh, this, this slide just shows three participants. Um, this was the actual um, point that we detected from the output of QSUM and this was the start of the activity. So we were able to correlate when an activity started and when and we saw some change in, in, in the process mean. And that's been very interesting for us again to look at the augmentation of sensor data with vital sign information. Okay, um, so the, 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 third, the third thing they want to look at is uh, in terms of improving the, the process is, is that really of, uh, of device placement. So we've talked a lot, I've heard a lot today about people um, wanting to assess or wanting to, m to monitor physical activity. And here we have an example of, of someone coming into our, um, our living room, they're wearing a, a mobile phone. Um, on their waist, that's just processing the accelerometry signal. And what we can do is we can generate these footprints of how the person moves in the environment and what those activities are. So we have walking, the person um, stood still, then they sat down. Here we'll see that they, they, they stand up. Um, all different footprints in terms of what those activities are. Um, this person doesn't feel too well. And then... <laughs> He's a great, a great actor. Um, so you can see all of the, the purpose here is just to show all of the different changes in, in these activities. So what we're interested is, depending on where you put the accelerometer on the body, you're going to have a different recording. Whether the accelerometer is orientated or not is going to have an impact on how you process it. So a lot of our work has investigated the use of the placement of accelerometries on the body, the multiple combination of accelerometers, what's the best configuration, what's the best way to process this information, and what techniques should we use. Um, and we have, uh, I would say, three or four of our, of our projects and PhD students are focused on the use of um, 
I don't know if you're familiar with the, the Shimmer platform, but it's, uh, it's really embedded in all of our projects for acquiring accelerometry signals. Um, so we, we, we want to, or we, we've recorded a lot of information, a lot of different exercises, and run a number of experiments to try and identify what's the optimal place and configuration um, of these types of technologies um, on, on the body. So there's just, uh, sorry if you can't maybe read that too well, but these are, are four different machine learning techniques, support vector, machine decision tree, um, Bayesian classifier, and I think that was a neural network. And we just looked at the sort of a stockpile of techniques to see uh, how we could classify the information and what was the best approach. Um, and surprisingly, uh, the SVM and with this data set showed to be the most appropriate or the most um, uh, accurate um, for the studies. So that was just looking at, these results show um, if we use one accelerometer, what, what performance do we get at that position on the body to classify what the activity was. So fairly, fairly high levels of accuracy and I did use the term marginal gain and everybody's uh, making small improvements on the accuracy of how accurate can we detect what the, um, the, the physical motion is, how accurate can we detect step counts. Um, so these, these were, was an investigation to see well where's the best place to put the technology and um, we then thought well it would be interesting if we see what impact does it have if we have multiple accelerometers on the body and try and combine all of that information together. So we took all of these and we created 63 different permutations and we tried to consider uh, well what is the optimal number of accelerometers that we would have that would have an impact on the performance. So this graph shows we had one accelerometer, two, three, four, five. So it wasn't really uh, we'd expected we would have seen a much more significant change in performance as we increased the number of accelerometers on the body. And what what this really tells us is from our experiments that one was enough. We had a marginal improvement if we used two, and an even less. Um, sort of significant change when we put three um, accelerometers onto the body. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, the most natural progression of, of that work now is um, we've considered that we don't always have an accelerometer strapped onto the middle of our chest whenever we go about our, our sort of free living conditions. So we're trying to investigate, can we identify where the accelerometer, or we use mobile phones a lot, where the phone is on the body. If we can identify where the phone is, then we can identify which of a number of different algorithms to use which are optimized for that specific part of the body. And we've seen from our, our initial results that that has had a positive impact on the performance. So we want to locate, locate first of all where the device is. And once we, we can detect that location, we can then swap in a different type of classification algorithm to process the accelerometry signal. And that's given us quite interesting results um, so far. Okay, so that's been talking about the issues of uncertainty with the data, the combination of, of heterogeneous data, the placement of um, the, the technology on the, bo on the body. The last um, area I wanted to talk about, um, and I've, I've just a, a few slides on, on this, is um, technology adoption models. So this is less of a technology focus from a, a, a data processing perspective, but what, what we found from some of our earlier work was we spent a lot of time developing reminding technologies. And after our evaluations, only a certain amount of people stayed with the device. A lot of people said, no, I don't want to use this, or I can't use it, or they didn't have a high rate of compliance. And um, we really find, and we investigated this, er this area a little bit more and found the notion that if we try and force someone with a solution that they don't want, that has a negative impact. And if we don't give somebody a solution that they need, that also has a negative impact. So at a certain uh, extent, it's a double-edged sword. So we want to identify, well, who would really benefit from this technology? Who would benefit from us introducing this, as this assistive technology um, into their lives? So this, uh, I mentioned at the very start, we, we had a project which focused on the use of video-based reminders. And we've been very active in this area in our group since, since 2006. And we, we looked at the data that we'd collected from one of our evaluations, which was, for, was with 40 people. And we were able to scrape data from 
um, yeah, 11 different variables like um, what was the age, what was the gender, what was the cognitive status of the patient, what was their living arrangement. And we took all of this information from um, one of our evaluations and we looked at the impact of adoption versus non-adoption. And what we found was we were able to predict um, just nearly with 83% accuracy who was going to adopt or not adopt the technology based on a, on a model we built. And that was quite interesting and was something that we, we hadn't seen before and it's really opened up a whole new uh, stream of research for us with, within our group. So these, these are the um, these are the, the sort of parameters that we gather from a, a standard evaluation. So we can take this information from um, a sort of a pre-evaluation questionnaire. And we looked again at some basic machine learning where we could um, try and identify what were the best um, sort of sets of features that we would want to take from this that we could then map on to uh, some prediction model or develop a, a prediction model. So we went back and tried to, uh, the, the first set of experiments that we um, undertook was really a, a first pass through to see would this even work and we got very positive results so we spent a bit more time we processed the information we tried to identify what were the most appropriate features from a knowledge driven point of view from a data driven point of view and then we a very standard approach of, uh, of looking at a set a stockpile of classifiers to try and see what um, performance we could get how could we rebalance the data set how could we look at the optimum set of features and sorry if you can't read that it's, it uh, looks better on my screen but um, our prediction we increased at the 84 percent so a marginal gain um, similar to the, the what I referred to but nevertheless again um, this was the motivation really that uh, this was something that we should, could consider or we could mo could move forward with but the data was very very limited we only had 40 users and we only had a small um, sort of portion of, of data um, to work with so we partnered with some colleagues in Utah um, and Utah, the people in Utah ran this very interesting study for um, 12 years where they recruited just over 5,000 people um, in the community who had some form of, of a cognition problem and they linked it with the Utah Population Database which is one of the biggest databases in, in the world and to look at and medical and vital sign information. So we have a very, very rich data set now over 12 years for these people. Um, we developed a, a new reminding app um, that we, we've now put onto the Google Play Store. And we've rolled this out with 125 people in Utah who are using the device for a year. And we now have all of their information on usage statistics, how much they, how, how much they adopt the technology, how much they comply with the reminders, what is their medical history, what is their family history, what has been their cognitive um, sort of profile over, over the past 12 years. And we're moving towards a much richer model that we, can, that we can generate for our technology adoption. So we have information on technical skills, we have information from um, this initial cohort of 5,000 people, we have the Utah population population database and we have information of how well they used our application. And our goal or our end point then is we want to take this model into a very simple screening tool that we can give to a clinician who can ask seven questions, they can fill out uh, very quickly at the point of assessment and that will give an indication whether the person will adopt or not adopt the technology. And if we can find those 80, if we can find the 80% of people who are going to adopt the technology, our view is we should focus our efforts there rather than trying to build a solution or build um, one model that's going to cut across all of the population. <coughs> okay, um, I'm sort of running over on time but I'm going to just finish on, on, on one, one last slide then. I, I, don't, I don't really know, I thought quite a lot about what I should put on this summary slide because I've covered a huge amount of, of, of different topics here. I wanted to just give you an insight into what motivated us to do this work, what did our group do, and what were maybe some technical challenges that, that we were dealing with. Um, I think the, the theme or the message from the presentation today is that the gain can only be marginal, uh, and that has been our, our finding. So we have to deal with practical issues to have a marginal gain. So we have to look at who's going to use the device and how can we tailor it. How do we deal with uncertainty in the information and how can we maximise the combination of heterogeneous data. Um, and finally, how can we identify the right person at the right time to give the solution to. And that's been our finding from our work um, in this area. 
And if we can maximize the gain, then we're going to improve the feedback to the user. If we can improve that level of feedback, they have a better understanding of their health. They have a better opportunity to, to self-manage and to have some form of, of behavior change. And I guess that's the message that we want to see if we talk about self-management. Behavior change from understanding of what the health condition is and how we can maintain or improve that, that condition. So that's, uh, that's everything I, I had to say. That's our website. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. We're hosting a conference in December that um, you're all very welcome um, to, to join us and just some ag acknowledgements there um, to the funders of our work. So thank you um, to everybody to come coming along. I know everybody has a very busy schedule and I appreciate you took an hour out of your schedule to, to listen to me speak. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> We're not going to let you go this easy, so oh. <laughs> there's some time for questions. Uh, I'm very impressed by the uh, uh, monitoring activities and the uh, um, decision-making uh, and modeling. Uh, one thing that intrigues me is the, um, that, that you, you don't seem to have been patronized by uh, um, different officials uh, or offices that would uh, inquire on whether or not you are, you are uh, too much in, intrusive to personal space. Because this is one of our headaches. As soon as we do something, then we have this sort of patronizing coming up. Okay. So whenever you say patronizing, what do you mean? Uh, well, you are, you, are telling, you are able to tell uh, what the people are doing and who they are. And these are very private Okay, so, so your question is really related to have we had to defend the intrusiveness of the introduction of technology? Yeah, um, I think from a, in a technology forum, no. In, a, in a, a healthcare technology forum, yes, all the time. So if we mention video or show video, lots of people get very cross and think that this is a, a big brother. I think you're familiar with the big brother um, sort, of, sort of concept. That there is, um, I would say from my experience, there's a split decision. So half, half of the people say this is intrusive, you can't do it. The other half will say, well, it offers care, it offers some solution to the problem, and if people consent, then let's, let's introduce the solution. Um, from, our, from our work, and we had this discussion this morning about the ethical implications, and, and for, all of, for all of our work we have to go through the ethical process, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, and this, especially when we have video, more so than sensor data because it, it can be quite anonymous, but with video again, we have a lot of challenges, we have to anonymize and we have to blur the video and where is it going to be stored and where is it going to be, be processed. So, yeah, I, I didn't mention it, but it, it's something that, that, that's always there. I would say it's, it's less so there with the, um, the sensor technology. Um, and maybe just one other comment, I mean, it, it, it's uh, maybe six months ago or nine months ago there were some news about uh, people being able to track GPS from different devices and not being aware that, that, that this was actually happening. And I, I think from the ethical or from the government's point, governance point of view, as long as we're clear, as long as we can have some consent and we're aware of what information and what we can gather from a person, then um, I think if we're open and upfront, that's, that's the best that we can do. But yeah, I, I, th I think it's an, it's an excellent point that you raised. Okay, I have a question. Um, because you were showing the research when you had the cell phones attached to the hip, yeah. the, the good actor, as you mentioned. And um, you have chosen to use cell phones as, as your platform for this. But um, what is your opinion on... Because the other option would be to have uh, some embedded systems that were specifically designed for this, which would give you a much longer battery time and what the cell phones are. Yeah. Why did you choose to do that? And uh, do you think that would be the solution if you actually bring this into the home? Or yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's a very good question as well. The reason that we use mobile or cell phones, as you say, quite a lot, and we try to build a solution or a service on top of what someone may have. So uh, if you have a cell phone and we can offer you a piece of software that you can run on your phone, 
then that becomes a cost of 59 cent rather than a new device like uh, I don't know a Fitbit or a fuel band I don't know how much those devices cost but our, our, our notion or our motivation was let's try and develop uh, solutions on top of the hardware or resources a person has rather than introducing another device or another component so yes the, the resource of a cell phone isn't good the battery life isn't good the weight isn't good but a person may have it and that that's our real uh, I think from an, an engineering point of view that doesn't make sense but from a practical point of view a healthcare technologies point of view I think it does it makes sense from an economical point of view yeah the other question is, if they have a cell phone, they might use it to make phone calls. and uh, Or they might use it for something else, to make uh, play games on or whatever. Yeah. We're imagining that my kids' generation become uh, the old generation. Yeah. Um, whereas the, the wristband or something like that, they, they would never use that for anything else. And they would perhaps not forget to charge it because it would actually last for maybe two months. Yeah. that you could replace it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll tell this one story. I, I told it to you yesterday, but um, the, the, the project that I spoke about, the video reminders for people with dementia, was our one of our first real evaluations that we had with people with dementia. And we had a, quite an old handset that we asked people to wear on a lanyard around their neck, and that delivered a, a video reminder so the person could lift it up. And they saw this video of a care which said, uh, okay, okay mum take your medication and they press the button and we spent maybe two years to develop this system and the very first person we gave it to they leaned over the sink and they dropped the phone <laughs> into the into the water and uh, I think that that was that that's whenever we realized we were naive uh, engineers trying to deal with this so uh, that's a, con a contradiction a little bit in, in what I said but um, uh, the, the, the work that's funded by the Alzheimer's Association from the US it's a fund called ETAC which is everyday technology for Alzheimer's care and their ethos is we'll fund your research or you can submit your research if you develop a solution which is an everyday technology so it's not a wearable shirt that costs 500 pounds it's a digital radio it's a TV it's a cell phone that the, that the person already has and I think the, the the motivation from Alzheimer's Association and dementia has been has been quite instrumental or quite has had a good impact on our work as well I think my benefit from these smart watches, right? Because then you can provide the interface and also use the extra meter. Well, yes, but uh, how many old people have a smart watch? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 it was just a comment. I have a yeah. question about. Uh, uh, you mentioned that you equip a different office in, into a, our department with sensors, and uh, how the staff perceive this or accept these sensors? Or it was just on the living room and the <coughs> or the kitchen? Uh, do you want the honest answer or <laughs> um, so yeah we have uh, well I can be quite generic we have we have 20 staff offices and we have sensors and maybe 11 of them okay. if that answers your question <laughs> yeah and, and the second is uh, the relationship between self-management and uh, as people know about their condition they might start to do some type of self-diagnosis so did you run across a discussion relating self-management with self-diagnosis or self-medication? Uh, no, that's an interesting question. I mean, I guess someone who self-manages has already been diagnosed because they're trying to self-manage for their condition. But uh, I think, yes, it's very dangerous. Everybody goes on the internet. People would say 50% of medical information isn't correct on the internet. So you don't want to encourage people to do that. And in, in, in our systems that we have for self-management, patient education is a, is a big component. And we direct people to no one, to no one site. So for uh, chronic heart failure, we have specific links and specific resources that are, that are recommended by the NHS that we would provide people or recommend that they go and read. Um, what they do after that, in, in terms of, of yeah I, I don't know Wagner because I think someone is diagnosed with, C, with CHF so then they read about how to manage CHF uh, but then you might yeah I don't know it's, it's interesting I haven't thought about that I haven't come across it either but I think it might might be possible yeah yeah okay Thomas. Yeah, 
if you start the this uh, missing data issue, if I understood correctly, so you use this damp step shot yeah. earlier to combine these information with the sensors. Yeah. And uh, there's some reasoning behind that. Can you can you comment on the choice? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, the, 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 main, the main reason that we used the Dempster Schaefer was we could discount the reliability of the evidence sources, which is, which is quite fundamental to the approach. So what we can do is we can consider um, uh, the reliability of, for example, a, a sensor on the kettle. And our experience was, the first time we put a sensor on the kettle, we used Bluetack, and whenever the kettle heated up, the sensor fell off. So, uh, but if we put a sensor on the door, we drilled it into the door and we screwed it into the door, so that was very reliable. And one of the techniques that, 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 that my colleague that I work with was familiar with was the discounting of the reliability of information sources. So if I'm honest, that came from some previous work that she had undertaken in information engineering that fitted very well to our problem. So it was all driven towards this initial, let's say initial step of discounting the information at the source of the, the sensor recording. So it's easy to use an expectation on different, on different sensors. Pardon? It's easy to use expect, to put in a model expectation concerning reliability of different sensors. Well, if, if you have that information, if you have the detail of 80% uh, of the time the information from the, the, the center is going to be reliable, or if you have some tolerance values that we find, like on a temperature sensor, we find it had a tolerance value of 95%, so we could weight the, the value by uh, by this information or if we knew that this day. Another issue with the kettle was we had a tilt sensor and sometimes if you don't tilt enough the sensor doesn't fire. So you know we studied the different profile and the different operations and took quite practical values um, from the sensors in our model. Yes? Yes, um, so I've thinking about the appendix Patients, such uh, as deviation detection of behavior, and um, also effect uh, uh, cognition. Um, if we scale this systems uh, up into uh, homes uh, and so forth. Um, do you think that these supervised approach is still feasible or is it when going towards an unsupervised approach. Yeah, yeah. So you're asking if we if we if we train an activity recognition model, how reliable or how appropriate it is if we scale it at a population level. Exactly. Yeah. I, th I think it. I think it isn't. Um, I, all of the devices or all of the solutions, I believe, need to have a training process. So not not that it's not that it's unsupervised, but you have a specific set of exercises so you can say okay sit down and you record some data and you train it and walk for 10 seconds and you record that and you train it or go upstairs or go downstairs because everybody performs those type, types of activities in a different way so I think that the, the techniques could be robust but there needs to be some personalization or some consideration for the difference that the population has across different activities mm. yeah. Eric? Yeah, so uh, I have a little uh, uh, question about the. Uh, you, you talked about the change point detection uh, yeah. using the Q summer. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, some uh, evaluation methods involve the knowledge about the uh, change point distribution. <coughs> Do you assume some uh, distribution of this? or? No, no, we, we, we used it, uh, if, if I'm honest, we used it as a very rudimentary technique to look at what was the point of minimum variance. Mm -hmm. And we just, we, we, we took our data, recorded it, we, we processed it afterwards. Uh, we post-processed it and we wanted to see, could we see a correlation between the point of minimum variance and the correlation between the start of the activity and the change in the heart rate. 
and that, that if I'm honest, that was all we that was all we used it for. We're getting very close to coffee. We okay. Everyone be served up. Um, I, I, just, I, I think I can be the last question here. No one has, has raised their arms. Um, this is, of course, extremely dangerous to do, but I'm going to ask you to make a prediction. Uh, so, what do you think would be the one to first applications that actually become commercially used in home healthcare? And I'm thinking specifically in this dementia elderly living. I think my, my answer now is different than yesterday before I had dinner with uh, you last night. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, th I think what it is is what it what it will what it will be is something simple. So a lot of the things I showed today, we have some simple things that we have developed. I felt today I should show some technical things. Um, and they're worlds apart. So you have your theoretical uh, processing of information and then you have something very simple like a voice reminder. Or you have a very simple solution that you can detect inactivity and you, ha and you make a noise to try and stimulate someone to, to be active. And I think it's, it's the latter rather than the former. Um, what that application is I don't know, but I, I think we have to have a reality check that it's, it's not going to be an elaborate solution and it mightn't be something running on a tablet or an HTC One. I think it's something truly pervasive, something... Um, but I, I wouldn't like to say this is it, especially not on camera. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> okay, well thank you Chris. Okay. Uh, this is a little bit like the TV show, so you can now chat with Chris after the show, <laughs> uh, but in real life, together with a cup of coffee okay. outside the door. <laughs> okay, oh, there. I forgot. Uh, we appreciate so much that you gave this talk, that you're actually going to get uh, a present from the oh. university here. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well.